some snacks and relax. The first story is called He Was a New Man. He had the internet to thank for everything. Without the internet, he wouldn't have known anything about transorbital lobotomies. He wouldn't have known that the relatively easy procedure was first performed in 1946. He wouldn't have known how in the 1950s the famous neurologist who invented the procedure drove around the country in a car he called the lobotomy mobile, performing multiple lobotomies a day on unruly teenagers and disruptive children. But most importantly of all, he wouldn't have known how a transorbital lobotomy could be easily performed with only an ice pick and a hammer. It was a splendid summer afternoon, the sky a deep blue, and the air filled with the sounds of chirping birds as Stephen Davies strolled through the bustling streets of Old Town, Eureka. A bundle of fresh-cut flowers for his wife clutched in his fist, and a newspaper tucked under his arm. He couldn't imagine ever being happier. Everything was looking up. Those dark, lonely days of old, when he was so sad and alone, were long gone, and he walked with a bounce to his step, and a smile blasted across his face. As he strolled down the crowded street, he noticed a little boy dart out of a store and race across the sidewalk towards the busy street. Stephen rushed forwards, and just as the little boy was about to step into the street, he swooped him up into his arms. Whoa there, tiger, he exclaimed, the little boy kicking and squirming. A frantic woman ran up to him. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. He keeps doing this. I just can't seem to control him. Oh, no problem. It takes a village, doesn't it? Stephen replied as he handed the squirming child to its mother. The woman smiled. It really does. Now, Joey... You thank that nice man, you could have been killed. No, let me down. You thank him. No, let me go. Stephen grinned. No need for thanks, but young man, you should listen to your mother and be more careful. The kid squirmed in his mother's arms. Let me go, let me go, let me go. The exasperated woman clutched the child tighter. You are in so much trouble when we get home, Buster. She turned to Stephen, a tired look on her face. Thanks again, I really mean it. I'm just glad I was there to help. Stephen smiled and chuckled, giving a little wave as the woman walked off with a struggling child in her arms. As he swung the door to his dingy little apartment open, Stephen whistled a happy tune. Honey, he cried, I'm home. I bought you flowers, orange zinnias, just like you like. His wife sat on a tattered sofa, staring at the little television in the corner, a blank look in her glazed eyes. Lipstick smeared crudely across her face, a long string of drool hanging off her chin. Stephen went to the kitchen to retrieve a chipped blue vase from a busted up cupboard. He filled it with a little water and gently pressed the stems of the zinnias into it. He set it down on the stained formica table and delicately took a clump of orange blossoms into his hands, carefully arranging them just so. 
He then sauntered back to the living room, whistling happily. Sweetie, you smeared your lipstick, silly. He sat down beside her and wiped her pale face with a rag, her slack expression never changing, eyes glued to the television set. He cleaned up the drawer that always seemed to gather at the corner of her mouth and carefully reapplied her lipstick. That's better. Taking a brush, he stroked her long blonde hair until it began to glisten and shine, quietly talking all the while. I've had such a wonderful day, honey. I actually saved a little boy, scooped him up right before he ran out into the street. His mother was so thankful and nice, and that manager, the one I told you about, that jerk had tried to get me fired because he said my lunch breaks were, too, were always too long. Well, when I saw him today, I just smiled and held my head high. Nothing can make me sad anymore. My loneliness is gone. You've made me a new man, my sweet, beautiful wife. She wasn't really his wife, of course. She was many things, a delight to behold. A friend to confide in, a lover to hold in his arms at night, a secret that no one could know about. But more than anything, a miracle is what she really was. There had been so many before her, so many failed, back in the dark and lonely days of the past, when he would sit in this small apartment alone, drinking until he retched. The loneliness so strong within him that it was like a physical force driving him out into the cruel world in search of something, someone, anything, to take away the terrible, gnawing emptiness that filled him. Often he would keep their corpses around for days, play things. Then it just came to him one day. Why not try to keep one alive? He was so lonely, and while their corpses could satisfy him for a while, he always felt such a sadness when he eventually had to dispose of them. His first experiments had been with a cordless drill. He would press the bit into the base of the skull, just above the spinal cord, and slowly squeeze the trigger, concentrating on remaining steady while the bit bore through the flesh and hit bone. When he felt the bit break through the skull and into the soft tissue of the brain, he would work it slowly back and forth. But it never worked. They always died quickly. He experimented with making the hole smaller, adding acid into the wound. Once one stayed alive for a whole day, but then, when he got home from work, he found her pale and stiff with blue lips, sprawled on the floor in a mess of urine and feces. That was when he decided to do some research. The plethora of information he found on the internet was astounding. The articles he read on lobotomies were very informative and detailed. How could he have been so stupid before? He had been digging into the cerebellum. What he needed to be doing was severing the connections in the brain's prefrontal lobe. He could do this very simply by performing a transorbital lobotomy. He had really only wanted to go into the back of the head so he could keep their faces pretty. But he could just go in, right through the corner of the eye. It was a very exciting time. If he was careful, going in through the eye socket would only leave a slight bruise that would quickly heal up. The first time he tried it had been another failure. She was a skinny little redhead with pale skin and freckles who was very cute. He had performed the operation just like the internet described, placing the ice pick 
into the corner of her left eye. He slowly slid the sharp point in, carefully pushing the eyeball aside until the tip hit the eye socket. Then, with swift, scraping motions, he separated the frontal lobes from the thalamus, but it didn't work. When she woke, though she seemed dazed and couldn't speak right, she still maintained too many of her senses and basic motor functions. When he approached her, she started screaming and hitting him. He wanted to try again, but he felt that old rage build up in him, that terrible rage born of loneliness, and he beat her head with a crowbar, some calm part deep inside himself watching, as if from a distance, as blood and bone showered up into his face. It was a real shame. She had been so cute before he put that nasty crater in her face. He had tried to look into the fractured skull, examine her brain, see the pattern of marks her lobotomy had caused, but it was just a mess of mangled grey matter flecked with shattered skull. He still kept her around for a couple of days, though. It was strange waking up in the morning with this faceless creature beside him. A bit unnerving, really. But it had staved off the loneliness, at least for a short time. With the next one, his sweet and beautiful wife, Kathy, everything had gone perfect, just perfect. He looked at her and smiled. He was so lucky, so blessed, really. Do you mind if I change the channel, sweetie? He asked, putting down the hairbrush and flicking the remote. Look, American Idol, your favourite. She gurgled quietly, a new line of drool forming at the corner of her mouth. He went back to the kitchen and put a pot on the stove, dumped a can of soup into it, and while he did, hummed to himself. When it began to steam and bubble, he poured it into a bowl, put it on a tray with a spoon, and brought it out to the living room. He tucked a napkin into the neckline of her dress and spooned some soup into her mouth. She moaned very lightly, but swallowed the soup. That a girl, that a girl, got to keep your strength up, especially now that you're going to be a mummy. He gazed down at the round bulge in her belly, emotion swelling up within him, and spooned another mouthful of soup between her stack lips. He was going to be a father. Tears welled up in his eyes. It was a great day, a marvellous day, the best day of his life. He was going to be a father. Now that he had a family, he would never be lonely again. The next story is called Malodorous. Does this smell odd to you? Karen asked, suspiciously eyeing the noodles wrapped around her fork. A constant clamour of a shopping mall's food court rumbled around them as Glenn looked up at her from his own plate. A piece of Mongolian beef and the vice grip of his chopsticks he raised a quizzical eyebrow at her as she proffered her utensil. Seems like you think everything smells odd to you nowadays, Kay. He teased. Hey, I'm pregnant, I'm allowed. Karen snapped back playfully, her free hand straight to her stomach, where her already prominent baby bulge had begun to show. She and Glenn had been trying for years to have a child. Now it was finally happening for them. They had come to the mall to shop for baby clothes and toys. They were just leaving the gymbury when Karen had suddenly begun to crave Chinese food and hot dogs. A few minutes later, and here they were at the food court, Karen eating her hot dog lo mein, and her husband eating beef and fried rice. Yet, even though the food had sounded good to her, it suddenly seemed to smell 
strange. Suppressing a grin, Glenn took a fork and gave the contents an exaggerated sniff. He paused as if in deep contemplation before responding. Mm, yes, a full bouquet is rich but not overpowering. A hint of hot dog really brings out the savoury aroma. All right, all right, wise guy, she replied, taking back the fork. I was just wondering is all. They ate in silence for a few minutes. Karen did her best to ignore the odd smell. It was a rotten, cloying scent, just on the edge of smelling. As she chewed, she absentmindedly looked around for an open trash can. Finding nothing to explain the scent, she turned back to Glenn. I really wish you didn't have to go back to work tomorrow, she remarked. When he grunted in agreement, she continued. We really haven't found that much for the baby, and we still have to shop for cradles. Couldn't you take the day off? Wish I could, Kay, he responded, genuine longing in his voice. With all the option visits we have scheduled, though, I don't really have any extra days to work with. We can come out shopping again next weekend. Karen nodded her agreement, twirling more noodles around her fork and spearing a hot dog slice on the end. As she poured it to her mouth, she was suddenly washed over by the stench. It was stronger now, as if someone had opened a trash can right next to her table. Disgustedly, she put down her fork and slid the plate across the table. Glenn looked up at her curiously. I'm full, she said. Let's head over to the cinnamon bun place for dessert. The next day found Karen at home, scrubbing the floor vigorously. Ever since she had returned home the previous evening, the smell had persisted. At first she tried to ignore it, but as time went on it became stronger and stronger. She had taken a shower, and Glenn had done the same, but that had no effect. She had blown her nose, taken out every trash bin in the house, and checked all the food for mold. Everything came up clean. Glenn had not been helpful either. After about two hours of dealing with the phantom scent, he was content to believe it was all in Karen's head and had gone to bed. Grudgingly, Karen had followed him. She had not slept a wink that night, however, and was committed to eradicating the smell the next day. She sat from her kneeling position, wiping the sweat from her forehead with her arm. This was the last floor in the house. She could smell the pervasive scent of Pinosol, but all it did was mingle with a terrible scent that she could not seem to get rid of. She stood, grateful that she was not very far along in her pregnancy. Getting up on her own was going to be tough soon. Still, it would be worth it. A fresh wave of putrid odour assaulted her anew. She dry-heaved a few times before the odour abated enough to breathe properly. She knew it was real. It had to be. She feverishly began her search anew. She walked around the outside of the home, looking for dead animals. She checked the vents for rats or bugs. She even went into the attic to search for rotting clothing or wood. Everything seemed fine. The day ran on, and Glenn still hadn't returned home from work. She sat on the couch, miserable and sick to her stomach. Every hour the smell grew stronger, and she had vomited until there was nothing left in her stomach to bring up. She descended into a feverish haze, as wave after wave of nausea took her. Frantically, she tried to think of anything she may have missed. She had smelled it at the mall. She smelled it here, inside and out. Whatever it was didn't seem to be in any one place. It seemed like the scent was following her around everywhere she went. 
It was almost as if, as if, she looked down at her own slightly distended gut, as if she was carrying it with her. Glenn arrived home just as it was getting dark outside. He had to stay late at work due to a pressing deadline. By now he was ready for a nice dinner and some relaxing cuddling on the couch with Karen. Smiling to himself, he stepped out of his vehicle. The first thing he noticed was that despite the darkness outside, there was no light in the house. Figuring that Karen must have gone to sleep after a long day of bad smells, Glenn undid the lock and opened the door. The stench hit him like a tidal wave. It rushed over him, making him feel disgusted and causing him to retch. He went down to one knee, bracing himself against the door frame and blindly seeking the light switch with his hands. He felt his knee become soaked in the cool viscous fluid. He called out for Karen before retching again, becoming aware of another smell underlying the putrid rot, the coppery smell of blood. G Glenn, is that you? Looking up, Glenn saw a slumped silhouette against the far wall, suddenly fearful for his wife. He left off searching for the switch, made it to his feet, carefully moved across the slick floor to where she sat. Even in the failing light, he could see that her skin was ashen. She had a glazed look to her eyes that dully reflected the failing light from the window. She smiled faintly as she looked at him. Glenn, I found it, she whispered faintly. I knew I wasn't crazy. I knew I could smell something. But I threw it out. It's all better now. Karen fell silent. Desperately, Glenn pulled out his cell phone to call 911. What he saw in the light of the glowing screen caused him to freeze. There was a large kitchen knife in Karen's hand. Across the width of her stomach was a large cut, through which entrails could slightly be seen. Blood, viscera, and something else pulled away from her, covering the floor. The scent came again, then, throwing him into a fit of convulsions and retching. Glenn fell to the ground, hacking and coughing. His vision began to swim, and as his consciousness faded, he could make out the faint sound of something, making slopping and smacking sounds as it dragged itself across the kitchen floor. So, what was it that she pulled out of her stomach, if it wasn't a baby? Super creepy. The next one is called The Long List. When Melissa was 14 years old, her father sold her to a crank cook named Possum, for two pounds of crystal meth and a broken down Trans Am. Possum kept her chained to a rusty wood stove during the day, with a mason drawer of water and a box of Cheerios, while he worked in the lab back behind the trailer, breaking Sudafed and ephedrine tablets down into glass-like shards of amphetamine. In the evening, Possum would swing open the door, the cat pissed stench of burning chemicals wafting into the tiny trailer, and unchain her so she could make him meals, wash dishes, and mop. At night, as the bullfrogs began to bark and the crickets chirped, she would press her fists into her mouth, trying to stifle her cries of pain as he lay upon her his rank smell of sweat and chemicals overwhelming her. Two months later, a couple of boy scouts found her naked corpse in a drainage ditch in a patch of woods outside of Eureka, California, a pale tangle of limbs sticking out of the trash and sewage of the dirty culvert. Though the case officially went to homicide, Detective McClenny, Detective Standler had been at the crime scene assisting. Standler had been helping take her by the arms and pull her remains from the rank 
as it were water and debris. As her body rose up from the muck, her head had lolled to the side, and her wide, staring eyes had looked straight at him. For a moment, Stanler thought he saw a flicker of life register in them, though her grey, bloated face clearly revealed she was long, long dead. Stanler settled deeper into the seat of his car, and flipped open the battery copy of Hamlet, scrolled down the long list of names he had scrolled on the last page. What a week! Suspended and out on bail, looking at manslaughter charges. He was parked in front of the police chief's suburban home, waiting for the fatty to arrive home from work. He eyed the long list and sipped from a pint of wild dirt, washing it down with a warm Budweiser, and thought to himself, someone who could do something like that to a fourteen-year-old girl, how can you let someone like that live? Who would possibly miss them? Who could possibly care? And no one had. Nobody missed Possum. Two weeks paid administrative leave was all Stambler had received after he emptied his service revolver into the sick degenerate's face. It had been a big bust, the lab, kilos of meth, and an arsenal of weapons. Everyone in the department was happy, and all he had gotten was two weeks paid leave and a wild party at the alibi. Thrown by the other detectives and a gaggle of uniformed officers, when the inquest asked him why he had gone out there, outside his jurisdiction, to that backwards no-man's land, he had simply replied he was following up on a lead from an informant. What was he going to say? That a ghost had told him where to look? That the little dead girl had come back from the grave and told him? That in the dark, pre-dawn hours, that twilight time between sick drunk and excruciatingly hungover, he would awake, lacquered in sweat, his wife snoring loudly beside him, the room spinning, his heart threatening to break free from his chest, and there she would be, a frail little girl at the foot of his bed, her stick figure limbs draped in a white nightie, its hemline stained in dark crimson streaks. The first time he had seen her, he had screamed, horrified, the raspy noise of his own startled voice burning his dry mouth and throat. His wife awoke and shot straight up in bed. What is it? What is it? Stanley blinked his alcohol-swollen eyes. Only darkness. The girl was gone. There was nothing. Nothing, honey. It was nothing. Just go back to sleep. I just had a nightmare. Okay, honey. His wife had rolled back over and immediately began snoring again. He lay there till the room grew pale in the morning light, his flesh tingling, wondering what he had seen, if he was going insane. The next time the little girl had appeared, he was calmer. He blinked twice quickly, expecting her ghostly form to disappear like the last time. But she didn't disappear. She remained there, looking down at him, with her cold eyes, sunken deep in their dark sockets. He stared in disbelief. Was it real? Could this pale figure possibly be real? That's when she had stepped up to him, quickly, and her blue lips parted, and she began to speak, to tell him things in a whisper. He thought he could smell the grave on her breath, as she murmured in his ear about the night her father had sold her to Possum. It had been a dark night, deep in the backwoods of southern Humboldt, past the mountains of Alderpoint and Bloxburg, in a place that didn't even have a name, near Zinnia, on the Trinity border, where it snowed in the winter, and the cold mornings found the hills hardened in ice. The sky was black, and it was pouring rain, her father had been drunk, and handled her roughly, pulling her by the arm through the muddy front yard. She was terrified and devastated, and her daddy's big tanner locking boots 
was splashing mud up all over her dress. Her mother had been dead less than three weeks. Her father had shoved her roughly through the front door of Possum's trailer. She's all yours, her father had spat at the old bearded man in greasy overalls. Possum had shuffled forward and took her cheeks into his grizzled, calloused hand, squeezing her face tightly, moving her head back and forth for inspection. Oh, she's a pretty one. If you say so, her father said. She's got that weird eye and those messed up teeth. But she can cook real good and clean. She's damn handy with a broom. Oh yes, the old man chuckled, handing over the sealed bundles of meth and vitamine. She'll do, she'll do nicely. And two months later, she was dead and abandoned like so much trash. How could he have let them live? And no one missed Possum. No one mourned him. They had thrown Standler a party. He had been a hero. That time. The second time was different. That one had gotten him suspended, most likely fired. No pension, no 401k. He might even see some time for that one. Standler sipped his whiskey, reached down between his legs and lifted up the Beretta. An old pistol his father had given it to him long ago. He cradled the heavy, cold weight of the gun, waiting for his old boss to arrive back at his nice suburban home. Maybe his wife would find him dead on their well-manicured front lawn. Maybe one of his teenage kids. Oh well, to have a sicko like that for a father. Just deserts. It was a warm night and he had the window down. A whine of passing trucks on 101, softly humming in his ears. He thought of Hamlet. He had taken a Shakespeare class back in college when he was studying criminal law. Still entertaining the idea of going on to law school and becoming an attorney. Before Charlotte got pregnant and he quit school and joined the force so he could start making money for his new family only to have her give birth to a stillborn boy seven months later, never to conceive again. Hamlet, that tale of the haunted Danish prince, had always stuck with him. Standing atop the castle parapet, the ghost of his father crying out for him to avenge his savage murder. Ghost, my hour is almost come when I, to sulfurous and tormenting flames, must render up myself. Standler always wondered, was Hamlet insane? But no, that would mean they were all insane. Horatio, Marcellus, Bernardo, they had all seen it. They couldn't all be insane. It had to be true. The ghost had to be real. The second time the little girl told Standler to kill, things hadn't worked out like they had with Possum. My father, she had whispered. Kill him. And how couldn't he? Anyone who would do something as sick as sell their own daughter surely deserved to die. She described his car, where he would be, the pound of meth Standler would find in the trunk, the clock he always kept under his seat. Standler had waited at the Red Lion Hotel on Broadway, right where the little girl had told him to. And just like clockwork, the car had rolled right into the parking lot. Standler had been amused at the look of surprise on the man's face when he strolled up with his 38 level right to his eye level, squeezing a round off before the jerk even had a chance to utter a word. But there was no meth in the trunk, no gun under the seat, and it ended up it wasn't her father at all. At least that's what the investigator said. They claimed it was just some businessman from Santa Rosa. But when Melissa appeared before him the next night, shimmering and ghastly in the moonlight, she told him, no, it had been her father. They were lying, all of them. Lying liars, the little girl had whispered to him with her pale blue lips and graveyard breath. They had tried to hide it. It was a conspiracy. 
and they had fired him because the police chief was in on it. That's why the police chief was next. He had to go. That's why Standler sat in his car, outside his house, a pistol cradled in his hands. He had to kill his old boss, off that meth-dealing, slave-keeping, degenerate man. And there were more. There were many of them, the frail ghost had murmured. His wife was one of them. She had made the list. She was a cheating, meth addict, sleeping with the whole department for crank. The little girl had told him all about it, late at night, moments before the morning, when the earth swelled silent and cold, and his heart beat so it threatened to leave his chest. Yes, there were many of them. A whole list, and it was a long list. Maybe the ghost was just angry and wanted him to kill as many people as possible. The next one is called My Door Was Left Unlocked. I woke up the other morning to a strange scratching sound at my bedroom door. Groggy from sleep, I thought it was my childhood dog, Sunny. Then I remembered I was in my own house, and I had no pets. I got up and opened the door to find a raccoon skittering into my room, yelling in surprise. I ran to get a broom to chase it out of my house, when I noticed that my back door was wide open. I figured that was how the raccoon got in. It was odd, though, as I vividly remembered locking the door before I went to bed. I wasn't very concerned, seeing as I lived in a safe neighbourhood with no history of break-ins or violence, and I figured I had just neglected to lock the door. Remembering a raccoon, I continued on getting the broom. Flash forward to the next day. The raccoon is gone and my back door is locked. I made sure of it. Thinking it's safe to sleep, I got in bed and woke up to hear my back door banging against the side of the house. I rushed out of bed to close and lock the door again. This time I was a little more concerned. I looked through my house to make sure there was nothing taken, but all my valuables were still intact. In fact, the only things that looked out of place were the things the raccoon had knocked over the previous morning. I puzzled over it for a while before deciding I hadn't really locked the door and I just thought I'd checked it. Then the next morning it happened again. I woke up and walked out of my room, and there was my back door, wide open. This time, though, there were drops of a dark, red-black substance splattered on the door. Now I was worried. I cleaned off the door and checked my house again. Once, twice, three times. Nothing was out of place. This time I decided to add another lock to the door. I quickly installed a slide lock and made sure both the new lock and the door were secured tightly. When I woke up the next morning, the slide lock was bent out of shape on the floor, having been ripped off the door. The door itself was wide open, and inside my house was a mangled, bloody corpse of what I could only assume used to be a rabbit. I felt sick as I tentatively walked through my house. There was still nothing out of place. I decided to call a locksmith after cleaning up the body, naively hoping there was just something wrong with my door lock. When the locksmith arrived and checked my back door, he said he had never seen a lock in better shape. I'm awake now, unable to fall asleep. I locked my door and checked it five times to make sure it was locked. I tried to reassure myself, saying nothing was going to happen. The previous incidents have just been wild animals. I just forgot to lock my door the other times. Then I heard it creak. The knob turned on the back. 
was no sound for a minute, and then it laughed, an awful dry, deep sound. The laugh got louder, no closer to my bedroom door. Scratch, scratch, scratch. It sounded like nails on a chalkboard as its fingers ran down my door. Then I heard a wet thud, and the laughing went away. And now I was laying in my bed, my heart beating in my throat, I shakily got up and opened my bedroom door. There I was, on the floor, my body mangled and broken, and there it was, standing right in front of me. Human-like teeth that were far too big and far too sharp contorted into a gruesome smile, a long, pointy face with pitch-black eyes, an impossibly skinny body, fingers like spiny claws. It pointed at me, fingers an inch away from my chest, and then it shuffled out, with an anabolistic gait, through my open back door. I haven't been sleeping. I haven't been eating. I haven't left my room. All I can do is stare at my own corpse in horror. It hasn't come back yet. The sun is going down. Creak. 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 The final story is called My Wife. My life seemed like it was going pretty well. I had just received my bachelor's degree at the State College, and received a fairly well-paying job as an office manager. The thing is, something felt like it was missing from my life. I wanted love. I wanted to have a wife to keep me company. But the only women I knew worked at the office, and were drop-dead ugly. After coming home one evening, from a long day at work, I grabbed a coke, sat down, and booted up my computer. I was very desperate to find love as soon as possible, and it seemed my only choice was to find it through online dating. I visited a popular website, registered, and set up my interests in the hopes that I'd be matched soon. The next morning, I woke up and turned the computer on once more. I noticed that there was only a total of two matches. And strangely enough, one of the two was a drop-dead ugly co-worker. The other had no profile picture, but the name was unfamiliar. Knowing how desperate I was, I took a chance and private messaged this girl, asking her to meet up at a local cafe that night. The person replied back about three minutes later, saying, OK. I was very excited but at the same time anxious to see how this would go. That night I was bitterly exhausted from the tremendous amount of work I had at the office, but my excitement overpowered it as I quickly got home, changed, and drove off to the cafe. The cafe was only a quick five minutes from my house, so driving was no problem at all. I had no trouble parking, and soon enough I was inside ready to meet my blind date. To my utter astonishment, the most beautiful girl I had ever seen in my life approached me. Her most prominent features were her eyes, the most gorgeous grey eyes in the world. Hi, she said, smiling. I'm Christy. You must be David. I saw your picture online. I sure as heck didn't see yours, I said, and we shared a laugh. I could tell already we were meant to be. Our first date turned out great, and as it turns out, we did indeed have a lot in common. As I dropped her off at her shabby apartment building, we partook in our first kiss and I left. At this point, I felt like the luckiest guy in the world, like nothing could go wrong now. Christy and I dated for only four months before I proposed to her. And she said yes with great excitement. Our wedding went like most, but there was a desolate turn of people. The members of the audience included my mother, Christie's father, a couple of my closer co-workers, and a few of her close friends. She was just so wonderful, and I was so in love. That night, I lost my virginity with her, but luckily she didn't get pregnant because having a child this early on in a marriage wouldn't be too good. I wasn't financially
actually able to afford a honeymoon, but she thought it was alright, and being with each other was all that mattered. She was just so nice like that. In place of that, I helped her move her things into my humble home, where we would be living together. Our life together was going by so nicely, and we were the perfect team. A few months later, I learned at work that one of the co-workers who attended my wedding, Kevin, was found dead with cuts all over his body. It was unidentified who did this, or what happened. They told me they were going to medically examine him in a few days. His news really brought me down, and it made the headache I already had even worse. I had been getting pretty bad headaches, which I presumed had to be from overwork. I got home late that night, and it appeared Christy was already in bed. I wasn't very hungry, so I went up to my room to join her. I immediately told her about my friend Kevin being found dead, but she sat up suddenly, looked at me and smiled, which was quite odd considering the situation, and said, Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. I wasn't sure whether to be surprised or relaxed at her tone, but given her sweet nature I just ignored it and went to sleep. The following morning I woke up sick, coughing very badly and feeling the urge to vomit. I stayed home from work, which was the only nice part about it, beside the fact of Christy being so caring for me while I was in need. I love you, feel better the relaxing words spoken to me every so often that day. As night fell, she silently joined me in bed and turned off the lights. About thirty minutes in, I was having trouble sleeping. I wrapped my arms around Christy in an attempt to hold her, but just then my hand froze. I just couldn't move. Her skin was cold as ice. Christy, are you alright? But she didn't respond. I turned her over to reveal my wife, but the most horrific way I could imagine her. I screamed as loud as I possibly could, shoved her away from me and bolted for the bathroom. What I saw was my Christy with her eyeballs missing, revealing bloodied sockets, skin vein covered in droopy, and pale white skin. I wasn't sure about any other detail because my eyes were not fully adjusted to the darkness. I sat there and cried, until I suppose I fell asleep. Surprisingly, I felt refreshed that morning, but that quickly changed into fear as I remembered what I had just seen. My vision was blurred and distorted, most likely due to my excessive amount of crying. I had to push on and overcome the fears I had about whatever I witnessed the night before. I opened the door slowly, making sure it didn't make a sound. As I slowly turned toward the bedroom, I noticed she wasn't there. I heard something coming from the kitchen, metal banging together. I rushed over to check out the scene where I saw my beautiful wife picking up pans she had dropped. As soon as she saw me, she dropped to them again. What the hell happened last night? she asked but she sounded more concerned than angry. I felt like I had to throw my guts up, and so I did. I lied. She took the bait, fortunately. Oh, well, feel better. She kissed me and went back to cooking up breakfast. My weekend wasn't starting off so great. I contemplated what I had seen, what had just happened. I just couldn't explain it. I tried to think past it like it would never happen again, but it did. It haunted my dreams, a lifeless body, a lack of eyes, but the worst part of my nightmares were what it did. Her body would just stand up like a marionette and put its face to mine, sending the odour of rotting flesh into my nostrils. There's no escape, it whispered coldly. We'll be together forever. Grin showing her regular beautiful smile, her smile now sent shivers down my back. I thought I was losing my mind. I saw that thing everywhere. It was
was hiding behind a cubicle. It was lying down in the park. I was frantic to get away from it, but it just wouldn't stop. I wanted Christy, my Christy, the one I'm in love with, not that cool. I knew I needed to end it. The following day I walked into my house and saw the body standing near the kitchen, slouched over like in my dreams. I didn't take a minute to think before grabbing it and shoving it into the oven, resisting its struggle. I closed the door, turned it on, and although it was painful, I was relieved. The oven began to shake violently and emitted screams which were so pain-filled and horrible to hear. I ran out of the house. The pain-filled screams went on for another ten minutes or so, and by then my house was filled with a thick wall of black smoke. As I walked back in, the shaking and screaming stopped. The house felt dead, silent and eerie, like nothing else was alive in the world. I walked up to the oven to examine the remains. What I beheld was Christy, my wife burned beyond return. But strangely, her eyes were completely intact. I fell to my knees, just staring. I couldn't believe this. I was there for fifteen minutes, thirty, as the police started showing up. They came in and picked me up, and of course arrested me for being on the scene of a crime. I was put into a room and questioned. But luckily I was able to get my way around to their persisting questions. They concluded that I was a husband who got home from work, finding the charred remains of my once beloved wife. They told me everything was going to be okay, and that I would need to rent a room at a hotel while I inspected. I knew it wasn't going to be alright. I knew what I had done. And you know what's even worse? I still see her. It. Whatever. I killed her. I killed her. I killed her. I could never forgive myself. I ruined my life. Her life. Everyone's. I didn't want to go on, but here I am typing this. So since I wanted to try to go on through my insane depression, I attempted to go to work the next day. As I pulled in and approached the doors, I noticed that there was yellow caution tape in the front, with a small note stuck in the door, reading, Building has been condemned from operations until later notice, due to chemical exposure creating hazardous working conditions. State Department of Health I felt chills run down my spine as I read that note. Not knowing what this would mean to me, I decided I needed to get this checked out. I got into my car and sped down the road straight to my doctor. I neared his office and threw the door open, revealing I was the only client there. A nurse escorted me to him, and I asked him if he could test my body for chemical intake. He said yes and agreed to do it. Shortly afterward, he diagnosed me with a disorder caused by the inhalation of that certain chemical. Trembling, I pleaded for him to read the side effects included with the inhalation. He read them to me. Effects of inhalation or ingestion involve migraines, vomiting, weariness, and is uniquely linked to strange patterns and effects occurring within the senses. Long-term exposure may result in brain damage, mental instability, and severe hallucinations. That one is actually something that could happen in real life, I'm sure. Things like this have happened before in, in reality. 